We are in Matthew chapter 5 this morning again, continuing the Sermon on the Mount. And let me tell you, I, there has never been a greater sermon preached in this sermon. The more I study it, the more I am just overwhelmed by the sermon and the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ as he put this together and we see it connect together. It's, it's just amazing. Just, I mean, I, the words that he speaks are power, right? I mean, when our Lord speaks, it's powerful. And, and so when he speaks out his word, as we talked about last week, it does something, it performs something. But I'm even talking about just the structure of the sermon and how it connects and the wisdom of it, how what we talk about this morning connects back to what we've talked before and, and even all of what we're going to talk about over the next coming weeks, they fit together and flow together and connect together. The wisdom of our G Lord Jesus Christ to put this together just... I tell you, it's an example for a preacher. You know, it means I got some work to do to be more like him. And by the way, I'm okay with that because that'll be a work in progress until the day I die. Uh, but man, Jesus, such an amazing preacher. And I hope that you're seeing that. And I think you'll see that again as we study this morning. Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrants. Father, we just ask once again for your help. Thank you for being an ever-present help in a time of need. And we are in need this morning. Need of truth, need of your word, need of help to understand. And I'm so thankful for the promise you've given that you will grant that through your Holy Spirit in our lives. Convict us this morning, comfort us, comfort us this morning through these words of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our text this morning is the first of six teachings the Lord gives regarding the Old Testament here in chapter 5. He had, we have talked a lot about the Old Testament, a lot about the law and the prophets, but each one of these teachings is marked out distinctly by Jesus. They're marked out distinctly by these phrases. Look with me at 21 and 22. At verse 21, he says, you have heard that the ancients were told. Now look at verse 22. But I say to you. Now look at verse 27. You have heard that it was said. And now look at verse 28. But I say to you. Now look at verse 31. Now it was said. Now look at verse 32. But I say to you. Verse 33. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told. Verse 34. But I say to you. 38. You have heard that it was said. Verse 39. But I say to you. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, verse 44, but I say to you. Do you notice the pattern? Six different teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ here. We're not going to cover all of those. We're going to cover that first one this morning. But Jesus is teaching here the Old Testament. He's teaching the Old Testament. These patterns that he, he gives are an expression he uses to separate out each teaching. They're each interconnected, by the way, and we'll, we'll see that over time. But what is he really doing with these six sayings when he says, you have heard that it was said? What does he mean by that? He's telling his disciples, this is what you have been taught. This is what you've heard Notice it's what you've heard or what was said. Why? Because it was oral teaching. It, it, they, they remember they could not, for the most part, read. They were more illiterate. And even if they could, they couldn't read, the, probably have a copy of the Old Testament. That would have been a very expensive thing to possess. And so they didn't have the ability to go back and check what was said. So 
This is what they had heard. This is what they had been taught about the Old Testament. And some of it we'll find is consistent and right in there with the Old Testament. And, and some of it has a little bit of things. In fact, all of it is a little bit off because they would say this is the sum total of that teaching, which we'll find out it wasn't. And when Jesus then responds to, you have heard it was said, he says, but I say to you, we will find out that the teaching they were receiving was lacking. The teaching that they were getting from the scribes and the Pharisees, the rabbis of that day, it was lacking. It was not the whole counsel of God found in the Old Testament. Now, you also need to understand, Jesus isn't teaching something new here. I had somebody have an interaction with me on a, on a reel that I posted on Facebook, a video, and they claimed that, you know, the Old Testament is stale. What you said about the Old Testament being stale, that's exactly where I'm at, because that's what it is. And, and then they said, you know, if the Sermon on the Mount was by itself, that would be an excellent work. And I'm, somebody's never read the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus says, you don't know anything in the Old Testament, <laughs> that I came to fulfill the Old Testament. Someone isn't paying attention to what they're talking about. It was such a foolish statement on the face of it to say that because the Sermon on the Mount confirms the Old Testament. Jesus here is teaching what, has, what was supposed to be taught the entire time. He's not adding to the New Testament. He's not changing the New Testament He or the Old Testament. He's teaching the Old Testament here. That's exactly what he is doing. Some people think, well, this is a new teaching. It's not new at all. You're going to see that this morning. This is consistent with everything the Jewish people were told in the scriptures. It wasn't consistent with what they were being taught by the leaders and the teachers, by, if you would, the shepherds of Israel. And that's why I had read this morning in our scripture reading, Ezekiel 34. You can feel free to turn there with me if you would like. We're going to reference a few verses here. I'm not going to reread the whole thing, but I want to read parts of it just to give us a little better picture of this. Ezekiel chapter 34. God the Father through Yahweh speaking to Israel about their shepherds. And in chapter 34, beginning in verse 1. Ezekiel prophesies the word of Yahweh. Then the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. The shepherds were the teachers. The shepherds were the ones who were supposed to feed the flock. They were supposed to be feeding Israel the word of God. And God says, Ezekiel, go prophesy against those guys. Speak out truth on them. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says Lord Yahweh, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been shepherding themselves. Should not the shepherds shepherd the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You sacrifice the fat sheep without shepherding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. And the, the disease you have not healed. And the broken you have not bound up. And the scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you searched for the lost. But with strength and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Do you think God is angry with these shepherds? They were failing in their duty. They were, they were taking advantage of these people. And by the way, it's still going on in Jesus' day. That they are, they are just, they're shearing the sheep, so to speak, rather than feeding the sheep. They're, they're, they're milking them for all that they can get out of them. They're taking advantage of the people. And God prophesies against them through Ezekiel. And then look down at verses 11 through 15. For thus says Lord Yahweh, behold, I myself, will seek my sheep and care for them. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his sheep, which are spread out, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will shepherd them in good pasture. And their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing ground and be shepherded in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will shepherd my flock and I will make them lie down, declares Lord Yahweh. What do we call this sermon? The Sermon on the Mount. 
And God says, I'm going to shepherd you on what? The mountains of Israel. Jesus is shepherding them on the mountain there in the Sermon on the Mount. He is feeding the flock. In fact, look at verse 23 and 24. Then I will establish over them one shepherd, my servant, David. David is long dead in Ezekiel's day. He's not talking about King David. He's talking about the king that comes out of the line of David. He's talking about his shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ. My servant David, and he will shepherd them. He will shepherd them himself and be their shepherd. And I, Yahweh, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, Yahweh, have spoken. I suggest to you this morning that here Jesus is taking his place as the shepherd of Israel. He is teaching the people. He is fulfilling this passage of serving God by shepherding the people, by giving them the teaching that they weren't getting from the shepherds of Israel. The teachers that were lacking, that were not giving the whole counsel of God. I say this this morning, woe unto those shepherds, woe unto the shepherds of the church today that do not give the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. Woe unto them. You know, the lack of shepherds was not just in Ezekiel's day. It was not just in Jesus' day. The lack of shepherds are today. We need more shepherds. Perhaps God is raising up some shepherds among us here to shepherd people, to teach the whole counsel of God to others. In fact, Jesus here says later, pray the Lord of the harvest that he sends more out in the field. The fields are white. We need teachers. We need people to rise up and proclaim the word of God, to shepherd people, to teach the church. We need that. And God will raise up those shepherds. God will raise up those men to lead and to teach the true and the whole counsel of God. I have every confidence that he will do so. That they will proclaim the truth of God's word without apology The full counsel, not just the bits and pieces that they're more comfortable with, but everything. Exposing the whole word of God, exposing your life to the microscope of God's word that pierces to the heart, that separates intentions and thoughts of the heart. Pray that God would raise more up and woe unto those who do not do so. I would tell you, church, I'm thankful you're here this morning. I hope that God considers me to be a faithful shepherd. If for some reason God moves you on from Norton Baptist Church or you're looking for a church and visiting with us today, let me tell you this. Look for a church with a shepherd that feeds the flock. That's got to be one of your highest priorities when you go to a church is someone that holds to the truth, that will give you the truth, that will feed you week after week after week. And that will not shrink away from anything in the text, but will give it to you straight. If you are ever in a place where you are looking for a church, or perhaps something happens to me in Norton Baptist Church is looking for a pastor, look for a shepherd. Look for someone who is fearless with the word of God. It is what we need, is the word of God. So what did they hear? Jesus said, you have heard that the ancients were told, what were they being taught? And here we see Jesus say, this is what you've been taught. You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, 10 commandments are repeated twice. That sounds like a pretty good teaching. I'm, I'm in favor of not murdering. I hope you are too. It sounds like a, I hope so. <laughs> and then the, the second phrase he gives, whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. Numbers 35 verse 30 says this. If anyone strikes down a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the mouth of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. But on multiple witnesses, you put him to death. There is a teaching that's consistent with that phrase that you'll be guilty before the court. There's a court case that must happen, the Old Testament says. When there's a murder, you must be brought forth, witnesses must be brought forth to confirm every fact. 
to demonstrate the evidence that this person is guilty. And when they are, they're declared to be guilty and they're punished. Sounds like pretty good teaching, doesn't it? These statements are accurate, but there's a problem with these teachings is they're far from complete. Especially if you're a scribe or a Pharisee and you say, I've not murdered anyone. Therefore, I have kept the law. I am righteous because I've not killed anybody. At least righteous in this one area. If I've not killed anybody, I am righteous. I have kept the law of God. And what did Jesus just get done saying in verse 20? Truly I say to you, unless your righteousness equals, no, surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Surpasses. See, their righteousness was, I didn't murder anybody. I'm good. I might have hated. I might have been angry with people. I might want to kill somebody, but I don't do it. That makes me righteous. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That type of righteousness will send you straight to hell. Because there's a lot more to what's taught in the Old Testament than just don't kill somebody. A whole lot more even relating to this direct command, you shall not murder. And so Jesus here, in the but I say to you, gives us three parallel statements here in verse 22. Three parallel statements that can be compared to one another to demonstrate what Jesus is saying. A parallel statement, they're, they're kind of like poetry, right? We say the same thing a different way. Well, here there's three parallel statements. They're saying kind of the same thing, saying it in a different way, but each one gives us a little bit more truth, a little bit more revelation of what Christ is saying. So when he says in verse 22, but I say to you, the first phrase, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. What is anger? Anger is what leads to murder. It is the, the precedent to murder. It, it, it precedes the act of murder. The scribes and Pharisees would say, hey, if you're angry, you want to kill somebody and you restrain yourself, you're a righteous person. No, 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 no. That anger that you say, I want to kill that person, and maybe you've never said that. Or, but you might have said something similar, like, I'm going to wring that person's neck. We say things like that. We say, well, I have. Maybe you're not that bad. But you've said things like that. You've had thoughts like Maybe you never said it. You just thought it, right? And that anger, what is the punishment for that anger? What does Jesus say the punishment? Is it any different than murder? What's he, what's he say? Who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. What's the punishment for murder? Whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. He gives the exact same punishment. The exact same punishment is murder. In other words, he takes the same anger that precedes a murder and he puts it on par with doing the act. You've restrained yourself from murder, you're still unrighteous. You're still guilty of the same thing. When you murder someone in your heart, you're as guilty as you would be if you had done it in action. Guilty before the court. That's his standard. Anybody here say, I'm still righteous? I'll put my hand down because I'm not. I mean, I haven't been righteous for a day, if that's the standard, because there are times I get angry and, and, and I just want to punch somebody. I know I'm a pastor, but sometimes. You know, now understand, he's not talking, remember Ephesians chapter 4, be angry and sin not. Now, he's not talking about that type of anger. Did Jesus ever get angry, by the way? Yes, he did. We'll get to Matthew 23 eventually. You know, we'll get to him cleaning out the temple eventually. He gets angry. But his anger is always rooted in the character of God. You see, 99% of my anger. Oh, I sometimes have righteous anger. But it's about 1% of my anger. 99% of my anger is because somebody offended me. Not because someone's offending God but they're offending me. Now, I do get angry when someone offends God. The reproaches of Christ fall on me. And I get angry when people mock God. I get angry about that. And I get angry on behalf of God's character. That's a righteous anger. But let me tell you, that's not my most common anger. 
My most common anger is the wrath of man that does not produce the righteousness of God. We talk about, James talks about, right? The wrath of man, the anger of man that does not produce the righteousness of God. That's the majority of my anger. And that anger is as bad as murdering somebody. Pretty serious stuff. But he goes on. That's phrase number one. Phrase number two, the, other par- the next parallelism. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. Raka is a colloquialism which we don't really have a clear definition for today. It meant something then, but we don't have a clear definition of what that word means today. Clearly, but we know what it intends. And, and, and really, most scholars have said it means worthless fool. Empty-headed fool. Empty-headed person. We might use the word idiot. We might use words such as that. And he says, anyone who's looked at another and said, you're empty-headed fool. Or, really, you could look at this phrase as a character assassination. You're assassinating someone's character. You're not murdering them. In fact, you're not even angry enough to kill them, but you're angry enough or upset enough to go after their character, to defame them, to drag them down before others. Now, you might say, that's... That's not quite as bad as murder. I'd agree. That's not quite as bad, maybe, as the anger that leads to murder. But it, Jesus says it still brings you guilty. In fact, what are you guilty here? Who are you guilty before here? Whoever says to his brother Raka shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin. Now, we don't use a Sanhedrin, but you need to understand, put yourself in Jewish shoes. We always need to do that, try to put ourselves in the context of the day. And the Jews would have looked at the Roman court that would have held them accountable to be guilty as a secular court. But it would have been worse to be held guilty before the religious court, the Sanhedrin. It would have been a worse punishment. In other words, it seems as though the offense gets a little more leaster. That's not a word. But it gets less, right? It gets a little lesser. But the punishment gets a little more severe in this flow. You, you, now you've just character assassinated, but you've not been angry enough to kill, but you've only char- character assassinated, but now you're guilty before the religious court. That's a little more serious to the Jew. And then we come to the last parallelism. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. You fool, just name calling. Not even character assassination, just maybe a A quick, just off the cuff, you fool. Now, did Jesus call people fools? He did. He did. In fact, last week, you could say, was I guilty of this? I said anyone who doesn't hold to the Old and New Testament is a fool. But that's God's standard. And when I declare God's standard and call somebody a fool, I'm okay on that ground. Because God says they're a fool. So I'm just declaring God's word to you. But when I get frustrated with someone, I think, what a fool. And it's a personal, you got to remember, this is under personal animus. This is under the uh, the commandment of murder. And when I have personal animus and I start name-calling people, not maybe not quite as bad as assassinating their character to others, right? Maybe not quite as bad as the anger that, that leads to murder, and definitely not as bad as killing them. It's maybe leaster yet, right? Maybe the least of all. But what's the punishment? Least or more severe? It says shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now, let me tell you, I would much rather go to prison for the rest of my life. I would much rather be held guilty before the church than to go to hell. The word fiery hell here is Gehenna. It's the dump outside of Jerusalem that they burn their garbage in, and that fire would never go out. They just keep feeding garbage into it. That fire would never go out. And that's what Jesus uses in his earthly ministry to describe eternal hell, the lake of fire. That's, that's the, the picture he draws, the dump where the worm doesn't die. And he says, you will be guilty enough if you just name call to go into the fiery hell. Pretty severe, pretty serious. And our Lord makes clear that our God values people and is against anger 
and against name-calling and against character assassination. Let me just point out a few ways that this is not new teaching from the Old Testament. Let me give you some scripture that demonstrates that what Jesus is teaching here is not new at all. That the teachers of Israel should have been teaching this. He should have been able to say, this is what you've been taught. Instead, he says, this is what you've been taught, and this is what you haven't been taught. This is what I'm going to teach you. This is what you should have been taught. Let me read some scripture for you. Psalm chapter 27. I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 37, verse 8. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Is that Old Testament Psalms? Is that, find that in the Old Testament? I, I think you will. Okay, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. He who is slow to anger has great discernment, but he who is quick-tempered raises up folly. Proverbs in the Old Testament? Help me out. I think it is. Yep. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word, like maybe raka, or fool, stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 8, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger quiets a dispute. You see how Jesus is not teaching anything new at all. He's just giving the full counsel of God, saying it's not enough to not murder. You have to change your entire heart. You have to be changed from the inside out. You need righteousness that surpasses that of the teaching you've received. Now, who of us can read verse 22 and say, I'm good. (laughs) I'm righteous. There isn't one among us, is there? Not a one among us who has not done this. You know, I sat with somebody once who said, I've never done any of that. I'm not kidding you. I sat with somebody... This was, I, I looked at them, I, maybe it wasn't the best counseling situation or best way to respond in a counseling situation, but I said, you're a Pharisee. You're exactly what Jesus describes. And you need to repent of that. Now you've told me you're arrogant on top of your sinlessness. You know, I mean, wow. I had never experienced anything like that. I mean, every time I brought somebody to the law like this who's an unbeliever, except that one occasion, I've had most people go, wow, I'm guilty. I've never had anybody do that, but some people are that self righteous. And that individual never received the gospel, never bowed the knee to Christ because they were righteous in their own eyes. And so this is the teaching of the Old Testament. This is God, this is Christ declaring God's commands. Does he declare God's commands? Yes. And God's character, the character behind the commands. Remember what righteousness is. It's God's commands and God's character. And we need both to be truly righteous. And unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to also note that as I said, these commands seem to get lesser and lesser as they go on. And what did Jesus say in verse 19? Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments. They might be lesser, but they're still in there, aren't they? You heard me read from Proverbs. You heard me read from Psalm. Anger ought not to exist in you. And teaches others to do the same. So they were teaching, ignore the anger part. Just don't kill anybody, okay? That's a good rule to live by, but there's more to go. They shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We need to hold to the whole counsel of God, don't we? We need to love God's righteousness, which means his commands and the character that undergirds those commands. That's the righteousness of God. And then Jesus gives us two applications. Two applications of what he has just taught. In verses 23 and 24, we have our first application. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Imagine you're a first century Jewish person, 
you're in line at the temple because many Jews are coming to bring their offering that day. So you're holding your turtle doves or your lamb and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting through the line and maybe it takes half a day. You know, it's like being at the bank, you know, and you're trying to get to the front. We finally get to the front line. You're like, oh, I can present my offering. And you're just about to hand your offering off to the priest. And boom, something hits you in your mind. I've offended my brother. I called my brother a moron last night. And he's mad at me for it. He has that against me. He says, if your brother has something against you, I've been angry with my brother and I've not solved it. And you're just about to hand, you know, the leash of the lamb off to the priest. And Jesus says, stop right there. Stop. Don't do it. No. Hold back. Set your offering aside. Leave it there. What if I lose it? Leave it there. Why? Because you have a priority. You have a priority. What is it? Go reconcile with your brother. Go reconcile with your sister. Now! Don't say, well, I'll get to that later. No. Don't you dare worship with that between you and your brother. That's extremely serious. But what did he just say? You'll be guilty of the fiery hell. Which is more important? Sacrificing or being innocent? Which is more important, obedience or sacrifice? Oh, we have Old Testament teaching on that, don't we? Saul was told to kill every, everything, destroy it all when he went against the Amalekites. Destroy it all. Every man, every woman, every child, all the, the sheep, all the oxen, kill it all. He gets done with the battle, and Samuel comes to visit, and Samuel hears sheep. Bah, bah. What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? So I was like, I've done everything God's commanded me to do. Then why do I hear sheep? Oh, well, we're keeping those for sacrifice to the Lord. We kept the best. See how righteous we are? See how good we are? And Samuel responds, says, Yahweh has much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yahweh. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Obedience is more important than worship. In fact, obedience is worship. Obedience is true worship. And so if you come here on Sunday morning, and you say, I'm going to worship God, and you've got all this sin in the background that you're not dealing with, that you're not struggling with, that you're not trying to, trying to get past, that, that you're not working. You've got things between you and your brother and sister you know you're not going to solve. You don't want to solve them. You don't care about them. Your worship is worthless. In fact, what did Isaiah 1 say? I read that in a call to worship this morning. And I want to look at that again just a little bit. In fact, we read verses 1 through 10. I want to look at Going forward, 11 through 17. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11 through 17. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says Yahweh? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats, I take no pleasure. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me, new moon and Sabbath, the calling of convocation. I cannot endure wickedness in the solemn assembly. My soul hates your new moon festivals and your appointed times. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Indeed, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Purify yourselves. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Execute justice for the orphan. Plead for the widow. Don't come here to worship God while you treat your horizontal relationships like garbage. God doesn't want that worship. He rejects it. It's a stench. 
And I have no doubt that within our congregation, there are some who are like, I know I have something between me and someone else this morning that I need to solve. I'm going to tell you, don't come back next Sunday till you fixed it, or at least you've made a good faith effort to fix it. it. Remember what Paul said, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes I've got people in my life, I've tried to fix it, and I can't. Well, I don't let them stop me from worshiping God because they won't meet with me or they won't talk to me. I don't let that stop me. But my door's open. Those people are welcome to come back into my life, and I'll try to solve it with them again because as much as it's possible that it depends on me. But if you've got something between you and a brother, your singing to God is like fingernails on a chalkboard. He hates it. He wants your obedience. He wants you to solve your relationships horizontally, not just have relationship vertically and forget about those around us. That's true transformation, isn't it? That's true transformation that only Christ can bring into our lives. It is greater to seek reconciliation with one another than it is to bring your worship to God. That's greater. And that sounds contradictory, doesn't it? No, I need to put God first. I need to worship God first. If your worship of God means that you trample on others, it's not worship of God. And we must bear that in mind. This is so serious. Don't come to communion table. Don't come to sing. You say, I've never had a pastor tell me not to come to church anymore. I'm telling you to fix it first. It's that urgent. You've got seven days between now and next Sunday to fix it. God will not be mocked. You can't continue to live with animosity between you and another, especially a brother or sister in Christ. Especially a brother and sister in Christ. But he doesn't, I don't think he's qualifying this with just a brother and sister in Christ. This is anybody you know that has something against you. You've sinned against them, you've done something, go fix it. And how do you fix it? First of all, humble yourself. Humble yourself. If we don't humble ourselves, we have no shot at fixing it. Because you may think, now nah, they got something against me, but it's their problem, not mine. Maybe you'll find out there is something that you have not dealt with yet. Go humbly. Go desiring to fix it, right? Go desire to reconcile. Not desiring to be proven right. If that's my problem. I want to be proven right. I'm right. They're wrong. That's not humility, is it? Nope. I need to humble myself and go meet with my brother or sister and say, what can we do to solve this between us? Or I have offended you. I, you have something against me, and you should, because I've treated you poorly. Would you forgive me? Don't make excuses. Don't say, if you didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that. No, you humble yourself before them, and you seek their forgiveness. And if they don't give it to you, what? Well, then you've done what you can do. You can't guarantee somebody's going to offer you forgiveness. In fact, what you need to say is, I didn't deserve it. That's why I asked for forgiveness. <laughs> if I deserved forgiveness... You know what, th th we need to remember that. That, that. that we don't deserve forgiveness from other people. We didn't deserve it from God. You certainly don't deserve it from other people either. And so if you walk away being mad because somebody wouldn't forgive you, you weren't really seeking forgiveness because forgiveness is a gift. Forgiveness is a kindness. Forgiveness is them giving compassion to you. And you don't deserve it if you need it. You're just asking for it. You're requesting it. You're hoping they would give you forgiveness. And so seek it. And if you don't get it, humble yourself and say, I didn't deserve it in the first place. I didn't deserve it, and I understand. I offended them, and it was wrong. That's application number one. If that didn't work you over enough, we've got another one. Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrants. Here we have a little bit more of a legal dispute between two people. Now, in the, put ourselves back in our Jewish shoes for a moment, and, and we'd have to remember what could have caused this. What could cause me to be an opponent at law? Well, maybe you borrowed some money from somebody, and you've been unable to pay it back. And now you owe them, right? You're an opponent at law. 
Maybe you wrecked something of theirs. In the Old Testament law, if you borrowed an oxen and the oxen died in your care and the owner wasn't there, guess what? You owe them an oxen. And so maybe you destroyed something of theirs and, and so they're, they've got something against you. Maybe it was an accident. You didn't even mean to have that oxen die. It just, it just happened, but the law says you owe them an oxen and you're saying, well, it's not my fault. But the law says you owe them an oxen and they're going to bring you to the law. They're going to take you to court. And what does Jesus say? He says, make friends quickly. Make friends quickly on the way. Now. This is an urgent thing. Make friends quickly on the way. Again, humble yourself before your opponents. Bring yourself to humility before them. Because what if the judge doesn't take your side? You say, I'm right. What if you're humiliated before the judge? In fact, Proverbs 25, 8 and 9, lest you think this is another new application, a new teaching, this is what Proverbs 25, 8 and 9 says. Do not go out hastily to plead your case, lest what will you do in the end when your neighbor humiliates you? <laughs> when you get before the judge and he, the judge says, you're the one that's wrong. Oh, I was so sure I was right. And Proverbs goes on, plead your case with your neighbor and do not reveal the secret of another. Jesus says, solve it between you. Don't take it to the judge. Don't take it to the court. Solve it between you. This fits very well with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where brother is taking brother to court. Don't do that. No, solve it. As individuals, as people, humble yourself. You know, so many offenses in our world today are the result of someone who will not humble themselves and just admit they were wrong. Do you know how many times somebody has forgiven me of, of an offense that I couldn't make up and I just said, man, that's my fault. I'm so sorry. Almost every time that person goes, don't worry about it. Almost every time. Not every time. Sometimes like, well, you still owe me. <laughs> I, I know I do. <laughs> and I, I, will, I, will, I will work on that. And I'll plead with you. Give me a little time. I may need a little time to help, help make this up. And by the way, if I'm truly repentant, I'm going to try to make it up anyway, even if they say I don't owe them, right? I'm going to still try to, if I steal 20 bucks from you, I need to restore you with 20 bucks if I'm truly repentant. And you may say, you know, you don't owe it. And I'm going to be like, yes, I do. Because that's part, you forgive the offense, but I need to pay back the restitution. Understand that. And so this isn't plead with them that they would just forget about it. It's plead with them, give me some time, help me, kind of like the steward, the unfaithful steward who pled with the, with the manager, the master, the Lord, and he pled with them, forgive me, I'll, I'll pay it back. And there was no way in 10 lifetimes that guy could ever pay back that debt. And what did the master do? He forgave it. Until the man went out to somebody else and said, pay me all you owe because you owed him a few days' wages, you know. And, and then he said, okay, you go to prison until, we, until you pay it all back. And by the way, when you're in prison, you can't pay it back, right? You can't pay it back. You can't work. You can't make money. You need, now you're dependent on somebody out there to pay back. You need a relative to come forward and pony up the money. And they're like, I ain't lending money to you. You already showed you can't pay back. So you're stuck. And that's what Jesus says here. If you find yourself in a situation where someone thinks you are indebted to them, Seek to solve it and restore the right relationship. Seek to solve it and restore the right relationship. This last application, I believe, Jesus intends more than earthly relationships. Remember back in verse 22 where he said, you, anyone, whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And here, Jesus says, truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrants. Those who go to the fiery hell remain there until it's paid. And you know when it'll be paid? Never. It'll never be paid. Sin against a holy, infinite God cannot be paid by you if you had eternity to do it. But you'll remain there until it's paid in full. And you know what? When, when Jesus says, make friends quickly with your opponent at law, you know who your opponent at law is if you are not in Christ this morning? God is your opponent at law. Jesus doesn't negate the law and the prophets. If you have broken the law of God, he is your opponent at law. You better make friends quickly with God. 
lest he get you before the judge. And by the way, the judge is biased, right? I mean, because he is God, and he's not biased. He's fair and just. But he makes right judgments every time. And he will judge you guilty before his law, guilty of fiery hell. And Jesus says, don't wait until then. Make friends quickly. Make friends today. Why? Because you may not have tomorrow. You might end up before the judge tomorrow. Make friends quickly. How do I make friends with God? Only through Jesus Christ. How, how do I solve all the unrighteousness I have because I've been angry and I call my brother Raka and I call my brother Fool? How do I make friends with God because of my sin and my unrighteousness overwhelms me? Through Christ. By getting the righteousness of Christ placed on you so that God declares you righteous and says, you're my friend. Because it's got to be paid. And either you will pay it or Christ will pay it. And I'm so thankful Christ paid my debt at the cross. And I want you to be able to say the same here this morning, that he paid my debt at the cross. And that doesn't happen just by, just by existing and breathing that happens by turning your life over to him, by surrendering yourself, by dying to yourself, taking up your cross, and following after Jesus, by becoming his disciple. That's the only hope that you have. And again, I said this last week, today is the day of salvation. Do it quickly. Do you see the urgency our Lord is pleading with you today? To make friends with God today to be declared to be righteous, that's justification. To be justified before God, that he might say, you are my son, you are my child. You're not a son or child or daughter by just existing. You are only through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Put your hope in Christ today. Please, don't wait. Make friends quickly. I believe really Jesus is driving at that point more than he is horizontal relationships. I mean, I think horizontal relationships, there's application there, but I believe more than that, this is make friends quickly with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's the only true way to make horizontal relationships right. Because there's reconciliation brother to brother in Christ, sister to sister in Christ. If we're in Christ, you are my brother, you are my sister, and I will treat you as such. And I will try to reconcile with you till the cows come home. No matter how long it takes, if we have something between us, I will stay at that table and you keep coming to that table and you keep talking to me if you've got something against me and keep bringing it and we'll work it out. Why? Because we're brothers and sisters. Because we're children of the king. We need righteousness that surpasses the scribes and Pharisees and that righteousness is only found in Christ. You will only find it there. Plead with God that he would give you that righteousness this morning. I want to talk a little bit about the law for the Christian. Let me talk about the law in general first. Jesus has talked a lot about the law. We'll, I'll probably flesh this out more in future sermons, but I'm going to give it to you briefly this morning. Romans says that to the unbeliever, the law is sin and death. The law is sin and death. It shows you your sinfulness, and it shows you you're worthy of punishment. You're worthy of death. And to those who may be here this morning that are outside of Christ, the law is sin and death for you. And to all of you who are here this morning, at one time in your life, all of those of you watching online, at one time in your life at least, the law was sin and death for you as well. Because if we are outside of Christ, the law only brings me sin and death. It only brings me to the end of myself. It only brings me hell. But when Paul says you died to the law. It means that your death was paid for by Christ in his death. But that did not negate the law. Because now, that law that was sin and death before Christ, today is life and sanctification for you. That's what Paul's teaching in Romans. Today is life. Today is sanctification. Why do we as Christians still study the law? Because it's righteousness. Because it's God's righteousness. It's what God has called me to. And I want to know his righteousness. I want to know him. I want to become like him. 
The law is righteousness, and, it's, and, and Paul says it's life and it's sanctification, which is the transformation that happens in the life of a believer. They get justified as salvation, transformed as salvation, they become a new creation, and afterwards they are sanctified day by day. And those of us who are in Christ this morning can testify that, can't we? That God has been changing me for many years, some of us, <laughs> many years, and I still... I said this to some men yesterday. I said, you know, it's like, it's like if I was justified here, and here's where Christ is, and that's not far enough apart, okay, but just play with me for a moment. If I was justified here, and here's Christ, and, and after 40 years plus of being justified, you know where I'm at for sanctification? Probably, maybe there. You see, you're a pastor. Shouldn't you be way over here? God hasn't even been, he's been gracious enough to me. He's been kind enough to me that he hasn't even revealed to me how far I have to go yet because it would crush me. So he reveals to me little by little, little by little, little by little. And some of you are sitting here this morning and saying, I have so far to go. You hear about anger and you, you hear about how you're treating your brother and you hear about the, you, you know your own temper tantrums that you have sometimes and you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and you got a raka coming out of your mouth, right? Am I the only one? Okay. <laughs> I know you're being serious, and that's probably good. But you need to understand, he's, he's working on you. And perhaps this morning, that anger, he's working on you, right? That's why we work through scripture like this. Because little by little, he sanctifies us. Little by little, he changes us. And, and, and man, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm over here someplace by the time I die. But praise God, when glorification happens, whether I'm over here or whether I'm here... I'll be like Christ in the glorification. And I'll see him face to face. My salvation, my Lord Jesus Christ. I look forward to that day. But until then, church, let's continue to be sanctified. Use these applications to just let it work over your heart. Because the law is life for you. The law is righteousness for you. The law is sanctification for you. Don't let, it, don't let it condemn you anymore. You're not condemned. Let it change you. That's the goal of the law in the life of the Christian. Father, thanks for the law. Thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ putting it together so beautifully, so wonderfully to help us understand the law. Um, this sermon is so well put together. It's so helpful for me. Father, you know the anger I struggle with it. And there are days I think, boy, I've come a long ways, and I know I have, but there are many days I recognize I still have so far to go. Thanks for your grace that covers every sin. Thanks for your mercy that gives me the righteousness of Christ. So you don't even, you don't even pay attention to those failures, but what you do is you just change me little by little. Father, we want to be changed. We want to become more like Christ. Help us today. Help us this week. Give us victory, more victory this week than we've experienced in the past. For your glory and honor, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.